Hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. We here at UES are so excited that you are tuning in and learning with us. I'm Melly, and I have my coworkers over here, Zakai and Aaliyah. Hi everyone everybody. Say hello to hey. Them. Hey. So we here at UES are very excited to talk about a bunch of things, but before we get started with that, I must ask everyone here, who is UES? Do we know what UES stands for? Yeah, we're Unisource Energy Services. So we provide electricity so that you at home or wherever you're watching from can utilize your technology and appliances and think about all the things in our lives that require electricity. So it's really, really important what UES or Unisource Energy does for us. Now, Zakai, do you want to tell us what we're up to today? Yes, I absolutely do. But before we get into what we're going to do today, I want to make one thing clear, which is that we here at UES take the guidelines for social distancing very, very seriously. It might look like Melly and I are close together because we're next to each other on your phone screen. But in real life, we're actually very far apart in completely separate locations. And the reason why Aaliyah and I are able to be in the same room is because we're siblings. So we've already been quarantining together in the same house for a couple of weeks now. How many of you guys have been spending more time with your families at home? I'm sure a lot of you have, but remember, even if you're staying at home and practicing safe social distancing, it's really, really important that you remember to wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. Try singing happy birthday when you scrub the front, scrub the back, in between the fingers. Remember, just keep washing your hands and please stay safe. Zakai, what are we going to do today? Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's take a look at our agenda. The first thing we're going to do today is we are going to learn about energy efficiency what that is and why it is so important for all of us on a daily basis. After that, we're going to explore our natural resources, which is where our energy actually comes from. After that, Aaliyah and I are gonna ride these energy bikes. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna generate some electricity and power up all of these devices that you guys see behind us and are probably using in your own homes. Finally, we will end the game, end the day with a game of trivia crack. It's gonna be a lot of fun and we're going to review everything that we learned. So, Melly, let's get started. Thank you, Sakai, and thank you, Aaliyah. Let's take a look at all the apps we have here in front of us that we will be using. Let's see, do any of these look familiar to you guys? I think we should pick my favorite bike app, which requires movement, and I sure hope that you guys at home are getting movement and exercising because it's so nice outside. Sakai and Aaliyah, did you guys have a really good breakfast this morning? Yes, we had a super nutritious breakfast. Personally, I had a leftover burrito from a restaurant. I bet you guys didn't know, most of the restaurants in the state of Arizona are actually still open for business, and you can get food there. You just can't eat it inside the restaurant, obviously. You have to get takeout. So, what my family did is we went and picked up the food, then, before we brought it inside, we transferred everything to separate containers and then heated it up in the microwave to make sure that it was both safe and delicious. So with that said, let's use our energy to pedal up these bikes. Now, these are not normal bicycles, as I'm sure you can tell. You wouldn't get very far riding one, but they're very special because they can generate electricity inside of this generator on the front wheel. So the electricity is generated there and then passes through some wires over here to our light board, where we have all of our devices and light bulbs plugged in. Also notice, we have something that looks like a lightsaber over there. This is our pedalometer, and it's going to measure whether or not our system is getting enough energy. If it's in the red, that means Aaliyah and I need to ride, ride a little bit faster. If it's in the green, we're totally good. But if it gets all the way white, that means we have too much energy and we need to slow down a little bit. Now, you guys have probably noticed, we have three different types of light bulbs, and they each use a different amount of energy. Melly, will you tell us a little bit more about that? You guys are doing so great over there. I would love to tell you about those light bulbs. There are indeed three different kinds, and the very first kind that I would like you to turn on, there we go, those are our incandescents. Can everyone say incandescent? Incandescent. Very good. Now, take note of that watt meter as Sakai turns those off and turns on our compact fluorescence, or CFL. Can everyone say CFL? CFL. Yes, 
And finally, our third light bulb is our light emitting diodes, or LEDs. Can everyone say LED? LED. LED. Yes, so there was a difference, a change in the watts, which watts is how we measure electricity. It's a unit of measurement in the same sense of how we use meters to measure distance or pounds to measure weight. You'll notice every time Sakai turns something on or off, that watt meter is going to change. So please continue watching that and taking note of its changes. But for now, let's give our riders a round of applause. <laughs> Guys, it's so great. Here's a virtual high five to both of you. All right, let us proceed because we've been using this word a lot, electricity. And I'm sure you guys at home are doing a lot of web searches with your online schooling. And so the question that we have here is what is electricity? Yeah, think about that. How would you define electricity or explain it to someone who doesn't know what the word is? So here in our web search, we have that electricity is a form of energy. So when you're thinking about electricity, please think of energy and it's specifically resulting from the flow of tiny charged particles such as electrons or protons. There are two main types of electricity, one being static electricity. So for you all at home, if you have socks on, if you've ever rubbed your feet on the carpet and then try to shock your sibling, or if you've been in a trampoline and watched your hair stand up, that is static electricity. But current electricity, that's another type of electricity that's really important and what is responsible for when we are powering things through our walls, right? At home or at school. With current electricity, you need a continuous flow of those tiny charged particles called a circuit. And actually, Aliyah and Sakai, when they're riding those bikes, they're producing electrical or current electricity. But is there another way we could possibly like show what? Oh, um, what? looks like I just got a Snapchat from uh, Blair. Um, will you open it um, really fast? Like, it's okay, right, if I open it? It'll take like two seconds, really quick. All right, ready, go. Okay. Um, interesting. Um, oh, there's a video as well. Um, hey, Melly, we should open the video too, just like really quick. It'll take like two seconds. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, this is exactly what I thought it is. Blair must know that we were talking about this. Everyone at home, I am so sorry. This is one of our coworkers, Blair. He definitely should not be Snapchatting us in the middle of a presentation, but I'm gonna allow it because this is actually a demonstration of exactly what we were talking about. Blair invented these things called UFO balls, which are actually a demonstration of current electricity. Do you guys see on here, there are two metal strips? These are called terminals, and they are where the electricity will start and end its journey. So, if I touch one side, nothing happens. But if I touch both sides, I can get it to light up and turn on, which is pretty cool. My body is forming a complete circuit. But I don't have to do this alone. If I have Aaliyah touch the other side, do you guys think it'll light up? It does not, because this is still an open circuit. In order to close the circuit, we need to touch each other. And then we can get it to light up. Make sense, Melly? Yeah, I think I got it. So when you guys were all connected, you had that continuous flow and it was able to light up. And that's a great demonstration of current electricity, but as soon as you let go, there was nothing happening. Speaking of which, you guys were able to do that together because you're siblings, but you should make sure that you are washing your hands after you touch someone, right? And not being close to anyone who you're not in social quarantine with, right? So with this in mind, let us continue. Uh, Sakai, what do you think about our next question? Hmm, are energy and electricity the same thing? What do, you, what do you guys at home think? I think that they definitely have something to do with each other. Melly, let's find out. Yeah, turns out that no matter what you guessed, you were correct, because electricity is just one type of energy. Energy is the ability to do work, and it exists in many, many different forms. Actually, you can transform from certain types of energy into other types of energy, which is what we do when we use almost any electronic device. Right now, we're gonna go ahead and watch a YouTube video to learn some more about these energy transformations. Now, the energy transformations don't stop once the electricity reaches our homes. For example, we transform electrical energy to thermal energy when we use a toaster, a hairdryer, or a space heater. 
We transform electrical energy to mechanical energy when we use a fan, a washing machine, or a blender. Finally, we convert electrical energy to radiant energy when we turn on the lights. Say, awesome. did that girl look familiar to you though? I don't know, I don't think so. Sakai, was there something you wanted to mention? Yeah, definitely. So for those of you guys who might just be tuning in, my name is Zakai and this is Aaliyah. And we are here today with our coworker, Melly, delivering to you guys UES Bright Students. So without further ado, let's go ahead and do our bike activity and try some of these energy transformations for ourselves. So if you guys remember a little bit ago, I talked about how you get energy whenever you eat food and then you burn that energy whenever you walk around or talk or do anything else. What I didn't mention is that the food energy inside of your body is called chemical energy. So in this case, I'm using my chemical energy to ride this bike and spin the bike wheel. So I'm converting my chemical energy into mechanical energy in the form of the spinning bike wheel. Now, there is a generator on the front of this wheel that is able to transform that spinning mechanical energy into electrical energy, which is gonna flow through our wires over here on our board and come out in the form of light energy. Does anybody at home remember the fancy science name for light energy? Yeah, it's totally rad. If you sent radiant energy, you were definitely correct. It is radiant energy. So let's review. We have three energy transformations already chemical to mechanical, mechanical to electrical, and then electrical into radiant. But Aaliyah, what would be going on if I turned on this fan right here? Hmm. I think it would be another form of mechanical. Definitely, yeah. This is just like the bike wheel. It is mechanical spinning energy, which is definitely very interesting. How about this hair dryer right here? What might be going on inside of the hair dryer? Hmm, I'm not too sure. Could you tell me about it? Yeah, so right now I'm gonna turn on the hair dryer, but I have my finger on the cold button. So it's just like a little fan, it's just mechanical energy. But as soon as I take my finger off of this cold button, we're going to have our heat, our thermal energy as well. And it's gonna get a lot more difficult. So, I want you guys at home, watch our pedalometer and watch our watt meter in three, two, one. Oh, that was a lot of energy. Back to you, Melly. Wow, let's give our riders a round of applause. You guys did so good. I think you guys look like you were having a lot of fun. Am I right? Yeah. Absolutely. So before we proceed, I think we should do something really fun, really short. Let's, let's do a cheering chant for UES. But we're going to do it a little differently. I'm going to represent the letter U. Aaliyah, you're going to be the E. Sakai, you're the S. And we are going to say the letters together to celebrate Unisource energy. You ready? All right. U E E S. S. Are you ready? U E E S. S. One more time. U E S. Very good. Thank you. Hope you guys were out there moving with us. Let's go back and let's learn some more about where we get our electricity from, right? Cuz do we have people riding bikes in our houses all the time? No, we have to look toward our natural resources. So here, with our search, we see that natural resources exist. There are many different kinds. And on our planet, we interact with these each and every single day. We have light, air, water, plants, animal, soil, and stone. But when we're thinking about electricity generation, we must think about two different kinds of resources are non-renewable and renewable. Do these words look familiar to you guys? Yeah. Yeah. You want to help me out with some examples of a non-renewable then? Hmm. Is plastic a non-renewable? That's a great guess, Aaliyah. But plastic, we don't really use that to generate electricity, but it does come from a fossil fuel, which is responsible for our electricity, and that would be oil or petroleum. We also have natural gas, Coal, those three make up our fossil fuels. We also threw in nuclear on our list. What about some examples of a renewable resource? What about the sun? Definitely, that's such a great example. Thank you, Sakai. The sun, wind, and water, as well as heat from the earth, these are all different renewable resources. There's a big difference between the two. And I'm sure at home, 
you guys have been doing a lot of searches, learning some new words with your online education. So let's pull together some definitions for our non-renewables versus our renewables. It says here that a non-renewable is limited and does not regenerate within a human time frame, but a renewable does regenerate naturally within our lifetime. So looking at all of these resources, do you know which one Arizona is using the most? And actually Ooh. not just Arizona, the country. And actually wait, the whole world. What do you think Sakai? Yeah, I know this one. It is definitely coal. Coal is the most used resource. So for those of you at home, what is coal? Basically, it is a type of rock, and it is extremely, extremely old. Can anyone at home or here tell me exactly how old coal is? Hmm. Oh, let me help you out with that. Yeah. It is 250 million years old. Exactly, Mally. You might have read it because it was on the board, but yeah, coal is 250 million years old. And where do we get it? Do we just walk outside and find some coal on the ground? No, we have to mine it, just like in Minecraft. How many of you guys have been playing this game while you're at home? I definitely have. It's a lot of fun to play with my friends. So here we have some actual real life coal to show you guys. Normally we would pass it around your classroom, but obviously we can't do that today. So something to note about this is that it's been painted with a clear coat of paint so that we don't get all dusty from it because actually coal is an extremely dirty, dusty substance on its own. Now, where does this rock actually come from? From the ground. But would you, where does it actually come from? What makes it? Well, the answer may surprise you. It's actually a bunch of dead plants and animals. Crazy, right? So hundreds of millions of years ago, even before the dinosaurs were alive, there were plants and animals living on the earth that died. Then other things piled up on top of them and compressed it and compressed it and compressed it for hundreds of millions of years to transform that organic material into our fossil fuels, our oil, our coal, and our natural gas. So, as we've said, we can transform this coal into electricity, but how much electricity do we actually get out of it? Right now, we're going to play a guessing game and see how long we could power various household appliances if we only had the electricity from one pound of coal, which is about what I'm holding here. Starting with a TV, because I know you guys have probably been watching a lot of TV while you're home. How long can you power that TV? Well, you're right, I have been watching a lot of TV, so I'm hoping at least a few hours. Yeah, it's gonna be about seven and a half hours, which is definitely a pretty good long time, I would say. At least enough for a whole season of my favorite show, The Office. Now, who's been playing video games while at home? I definitely have as well. How long could we keep our PS4 and our TV powered together? Well, let's think about this. It's two devices at once, so probably a little bit less time than just the TV on its own. Definitely. The TV is now using half the power and the PS4 is using half the power, so it'll only last half the time, about four and a half hours. Now, we're going to talk about the item in your home that uses the most energy, the air conditioning. How long can you keep that AC powered with just this one pound of coal? I'm not too sure, but I'm hoping a long time because it is really hot here in Arizona. You can say that again. It has been hot here and it's just going to keep getting hotter. But unfortunately, we can only power the AC for 15 minutes using this pound of coal, which is not enough for a whole day, let alone a whole summer here in Arizona. And Melly, do you only have one thing on at a time? Definitely not, Sakai. Many of us in our houses have multiple appliances running at once. And on average, one household in Arizona in one year is using enough coal that's equivalent to the size of this animal. The elephant. So how much does an elephant weigh? I'm not too sure, but it's gotta weigh like a lot, Melly. It's definitely a lot, Aaliyah. It's gonna be 9,000 pounds. And like I said, this is on average one Arizona household in one year. Say, when you guys were passing around that coal, did you get shocked? Definitely not. For now, this coal just feels like a rock. We have to put it through a complicated series of processes in order to transform it into electricity. Let's talk about that with the power plant cycle. So this is the same for all fossil fuel power plants, but here I'm gonna tell you about a coal power plant. Basically, we load the coal into a hopper and it is carried on a conveyor belt into a furnace. In the furnace, we light the coal on fire where it burns. 
releasing all 250 million years of stored chemical energy in the form of heat or thermal energy. So we use the heat from the burning coal to boil water. This boiling water turns into steam, which goes through some pipes and into a turbine, and the pressure of the steam causes the turbine to start spinning. This spinning turbine is hooked up to a generator, and using something called the electromagnetic effect, we are able to generate electricity. Now, this is a pretty complicated process, but I'm gonna simplify it for you guys as much as I can. Basically, we're putting the coal through a variety of energy transformations in order to get a generator spinning. Because if we take a magnet and wrap copper wire around it and spin it, it produces electricity. This is what we call the electromagnetic effect. And it is what's happening in our coal fire power plant, our natural gas fire power plant, or our bike wheels right here. But this process is not without our consequences. Melly, why does our fossil fuel use matter? That's a great question, Zakai. And yes, I want everyone who's watching to think about this. Why does fossil fuel use matter? Did we say fossil fuels were a renewable or non-renewable resource? Non-renewable. Yeah, definitely, a non-renewable. But there's more to it. Whenever we're burning fossil fuels, we're producing emissions. And this is definitely related to what I'm about to explain next, the greenhouse effect. So think of our Earth. We have an atmosphere that protects our Earth. And when we receive heat from the sun, that is very good that it passes through the atmosphere and allows for some heat to remain trapped, keeping our planet habitable. At nighttime, when it cools off, some of that heat is able to escape back into space. However, as we continue to burn more and more fossil fuels, our greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor are trapping more and more heat, therefore changing our climate. So Kai, can you tell us more about the effects of this, please? Yes, definitely. Basically, scientists have noticed that weather patterns on Earth are changing a lot, and we know that it is because humans have been burning fossil fuels for a couple hundred years at this point. Basically, the more greenhouse gases there are, the more extreme temperatures we will see on Earth, both higher and lower. Do you guys want it to be any hotter here in Arizona during the summers? I definitely don't. Me neither. But this has devastating effects in addition to just the hotter temperatures. Have you guys heard about some of the tropical storms and hurricanes that have happened in the last year? Maybe Hurricane Harvey or Hurricane Maria? Yeah, these are not normal. Storms like this used to happen about once every five to 10 years, but now they happen every single year, sometimes multiple in a single year. And this is because of climate change. And these effects are devastating. Imagine what it would be like if your neighborhood was completely flooded and you had to leave and live somewhere else for months or even years. And then when you came back, all of your stuff had been washed away and destroyed by floodwaters. That's what happened to these people in this photo and I feel really bad for them. We in Arizona don't actually have to worry about hurricanes. We have to worry about the opposite problem, which is not enough water. Do you guys see where the tree line is? That's where the reservoir used to be, but that's where the reservoir is now. We do not have enough water and this is called a drought and it is one of the effects of this process. So, as you guys can see, burning fossil fuels does have some negative consequences, but we here at UES are at the forefront of changing this. For example, we converted the Sun power plant in Tucson, Arizona from burning coal to burning natural gas, which is much, much cleaner. However, the reality of science is, as long as we're burning anything, there will always be some emissions. But we definitely have better options out there. Melly? Thank you, Sakai. And this is great news to hear that Unisource Energy is taking great strides to make our air quality better and to keep our energy efficient. So with this in mind, let us go back to our discussion of resources. Remember we said there are two different kinds that we rely on for electricity and we talked about non-renewables and fossil fuels, but now let's talk more about renewables. Can you guys help me out um, with some of those examples that we mentioned earlier? You definitely said solar and wind were two of them. Also a water power. Yes, thank you. So we utilize sun, wind, and water. We can even use heat from earth. However, in Arizona, we primarily use the first three. So that is why we're gonna go in greater depth with that. And do you guys know which of these is the most abundant? 
abundant that we use? I'm going to guess that it's solar because there's so much sun, sunshine in Arizona. Think about all the sun that we get. Definitely. Solar energy is so energy that we can harness from the sun. And how we do that is through sunlight. Now, do you remember when Sakai was talking about how light bulbs give off radiant energy? Well, sunlight is just tiny packets of radiant energy. They're also known as photons. Can everyone say photon? Photons. photons. Yeah. So the word photo and photons means light. Whenever sunlight or photons strike solar panels, also known as photovoltaic cells, we're able to harness the sun's energy. Let's take a look at some right now. Do you guys have some in your houses? We yeah, actually do. We do. Yeah, and for all of you that are joining us, think about the ones that perhaps you've seen around your city or around town. We definitely have some in our state. In fact, we're looking right now at a solar farm in Arizona that has about 250,000 solar panels. This is equivalent to powering up 25,000 houses. Now, the way solar panels work, as I was saying, we need photons or sunlight, those yellow dots, to strike our solar panel with the negative and positively charged layer. And we have electrons, those blue dots, that are going to react they're going to be jostled loose, react to the difference in charge, flow through our copper wires, and then reach us in the form of electricity. And keep in mind, renewables, why this is so beneficial for us is that they produce zero emissions. So Sakai, do you want to tell us more about other renewables that we use in Arizona? Yes. Next up, I want to talk about wind energy. And personally, I'm a big fan of wind energy. Hmm. So, the way that this works is actually the electromagnetic effect just like we've already talked about. So, the wind is going to come and it's going to blow the blades of the turbine and cause them to start spinning. Inside, it's hooked up to a drive shaft and some gears and then an electromagnetic generator. Using that same effect we talked about before, we're able to generate electricity. But the difference is we don't have to burn anything to make this happen. We're just using the wind, which is already there. So this is completely clean, renewable energy. Next up, I want to tell you guys about water power or hydropower. Does any of you, any of you know where this place is or what it's called? Hmm, I'm not sure. Can you tell us about it? This is the Hoover Dam on the border of Arizona and Nevada. Now, do you guys see that body of water behind it? That is the Colorado River. And it does not want to be there. It wants to keep flowing down the river, not be trapped behind this wall. So, what we do is we carve a thin channel through the dam so only some water is able to get through. The water that does get through is moving very fast and under high pressure. We use this high pressure water to spin a turbine which is hooked up to a generator and using the same effect we've talked about before, we're generating electricity. But again, no fossil fuels, no emissions, no burning, just clean renewable energy. Thank you, Sakai. And yes, Unisource Energy is very excited about renewables and expanding our portfolio. However, do we receive sun 24 hours a day? Do we have the wind gusting at us at full speeds all the time? Definitely not. But we do have things in our houses that always use electricity and are always on at all times. What are some examples in your guys' houses? Well, the refrigerator is always keeping our food cold. Definitely. The refrigerator, our air conditioning, our water heater, and our Wi-Fi. Without the internet, we would not be able to stay connected with what's going on with our current situation or our friends and family. So this is especially important to us. Now let's think about buildings in our cities that always use electricity all the time. What about the hospital? I know that's important, especially these days. Yes, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Sakai. Our first responders have to be able to keep us safe and healthy at all times, so they are constantly using electricity. And then for us, we're at home, we do need food, so our supermarkets must always use electricity. Do you know why that is? Well, that's similar to like our homes. We have to have fridges and freezers to keep everything nice and cold. Thank you, Aaliyah, for sure. 
So as you think about all the appliances in your houses and all these buildings, there's so much more examples that we didn't even cover. UES, Unisource Energy, must make sure that we keep the power on and maintain our baseload, which we're gonna get to in a few moments. But know that our cities use a lot of electricity all day and all night. Let's see how it's broken down between non-renewables and renewables. This pie chart is showing us that 13% of our electricity here comes from the sun or other renewables, but 87% is sourced from coal or natural gas. UAS is excited to bump up our renewables production by more than double by the end of next year. Yeah, this is really exciting and that'll push back our non-renewables to 72%. So this is definitely going to address some of those issues that we talked about. And it's really exciting to learn about renewables, which we will be uh, addressing in a future video. So please watch out for that. We'd love for you to join us when we talk even more about renewables. We did a minor recap of what those are, but I hope you guys are excited to learn even more about that. So I think we're ready for another bike activity, but before we do that, Everyone, let's do our second stretch break. Gotta get up, gotta get moving. We should celebrate those light bulbs behind us and not just any light bulbs, but the two that are the most efficient. You guys ready? All right, so yeah. the first one that we want to celebrate is the CFL. Do you guys want to do the letters with me? Yeah. All right, are you ready? C, F, N, L, N, C, F, L. All right, and then what was that more, the most energy efficient light bulb on that light board? That was the LED. Yeah, let's do that one. L, E, N, D. L, E, N, D. Very good, everyone, thank you. So as you guys are getting comfortably seated, our riders are gonna start riding for us. Let's see what they're going to show us. Awesome, thank you so much, Melly. So right now, I wanna take us through a simulation of what our lives are like in the morning time, what devices we're using, and how much energy they actually take. So, I don't know about you guys, but the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is turn on some lights. If I don't turn on some lights, then I trip and fall out of bed. Terrible way to start the day. So let's turn on some lights to get started. Now, these days, it's actually been pretty warm, even in the morning. So I'm gonna turn on this fan and cool us off a little bit. So we got our lights on, we got our fan so we're cool, but I'm getting a little hungry. What do you think about some breakfast, Aaliyah? Let's go for it. All right, let's go ahead and make a smoothie. Say it's a blueberry strawberry yogurt smoothie. Whew, keep riding. As you guys can see, we're already at about 250 watts, only using a couple of things that we do in the morning. I'm sure this is not everything that you guys use in the morning, just a quick sample of it. So before we leave and start our day, let's make sure we turn off all of our lights. Melly, back over to you. Great job, riders. Round of applause for you, everyone. Please thank our riders. Thank you for bringing us through the morning. So let us use Instagram. There's that beautiful smoothie Sakai was talking about that you made with the blender. And I hope you guys are staying connected with your friends and family. Instagram's a great way to do that. Here's my next question for you all to think about. How did your house get electricity? How did it move? Ah, oh, very good. You guys are thinking about power lines, I see. Yes, power lines throughout the city are going to move or conduct electricity so that it can reach from the power plant to our houses or whatever we're building we are in. And power lines are great, but have you seen this before? This is a substation. So a substation also exists near power plants. It's going to transform electricity from high to low voltage so that by the time it reaches your house, it is coming at a safe amount. And so when we're talking about power lines and substations, we're referring to what's known as the grid. And that's how cities are set up so that we can move electricity and meet our electricity needs. Now, I mentioned this word before. Let's talk about it right now. Can everyone say baseload? 
Base load. Yeah, base load is the minimum amount of electricity that a city requires that a utility company like Unisource Energy must provide so that we can keep all of those appliances and buildings up and running. So let us see if you, Sakinalia, can meet your base load. Awesome. So, as we try to meet our own base load requirement, let's think about the time of the day when we're using a lot of electricity, the afternoon. So we're going to pretend like it's the afternoon and use some of the devices related to that. Since it's the afternoon, we don't need that many lights on, maybe about two. But I know I definitely like to watch TV and play video games in the afternoon. So let's kick on our TV. So we've got our TV on, we've got our lights on. It's the afternoon, so it's pretty hot. So let's turn on our fan as well. So we got our fan, our TV, and our lights. And we're only at about 110 watts. Aliyah, I'm pretty hungry. What about you? Me too. Do you want chips and guac or chips and salsa? Let's do chips and salsa. Chips and salsa? All right, let's turn on the blender, get our chips and salsa going. Yum, yum, delicious. Looks like we got the TEP channel on TV. All right, so let's go ahead and turn on our air conditioning unit because this fan is just not cutting it. So ready? Three, two, one. Everybody pay attention to that watt meter. That was hard work. Oh, wow. Hard work. Back to you, Melly. I am so impressed with you two. Round of applause. Thank you so much. But friends, did we meet our baseload? No, unfortunately, when we kicked on that AC, which as Sakai said, uses the most amount of electricity of all of our appliances, we encountered a power outage. But Unisource Energy does a great job of meeting our baseload, so that does not happen on a regular basis. Let us talk about another term. When we're thinking about electricity moving through our city and our electricity needs and the grid, we must think about peak demand. Can everyone say peak demand? Peak, peak demand. demand. Peak demand is shown on this graph, and it's, it shows us the total energy needs of our city in terms of megawatts. Now, one megawatt is a million watts, so this is huge. At what point do we reach our peak throughout the day? Well, according to our graph, it looks like it's around 6 p.m. Definitely, Aaliyah. So, around between 3 to 7 p.m. is when we reach our peak. And this is especially throughout the summertime. In the winter, this graph would actually have two peaks because we're using our heaters when it's cold in the morning and afternoon. Take a look at our renewables in the green. Does that meet our total energy needs right now? And what happens to the sun around 6 p.m.? Yeah, it starts to set. So this is important. This is why Unisource Energy continues to rely on a combination of resources, non-renewable and renewable. But as you guys learned, we're continuing to expand our renewable and that is going to be great as we every year continue to do that and make strides to addressing our issues. So with this in mind, Sakai and Aaliyah, we got one more bike activity, I believe. Awesome, let's do it. So for this bike activity, we're gonna take a closer look at some of the light bulbs that you see in front of us here. Now, in order to do this, we're gonna pretend like it's nighttime because that's when we use the maximum amount of light. So starting with our incandescent light bulbs down here. These are the oldest light bulb technology invented way back in the 1800s by Thomas Edison. The problem with these is that they waste most of their energy producing heat instead of light which makes them both inefficient and dangerous because if I touch one, I might accidentally burn myself. And if I drop it, it's made out of glass so it'll shatter everywhere. Definitely a better option is these, our CFLs or compact fluorescents. These are a lot more energy efficient, but they still have some of the downsides of our incandescents. They're still made out of glass, so they're very fragile and they can break quite easily. Definitely our best option is these, our LED light bulbs. They are made out of plastic, so they will not break, and they are very, very energy efficient. Melly, why don't you tell us exactly how efficient or inefficient each of these bulbs are? Thank you, Sakai. So yes, those three kinds of light bulbs, the incandescent being the least efficient, can use up to 60 watts per bulb. And you can see that's a really high number on our watt meter. But when we flip on our compact fluorescents, our CFLs, 
that only uses up to 13 watts per bulb, which is a much better option. And yet, we have the best kind of light bulb, the most efficient. Our light-emitting diodes are LEDs only using 9 watts each. Let's give Riders a round of applause. Thank you so much for keeping our light bulbs on and powered. We've been using the word efficiency a lot. I just want to make sure you guys understand what that means. When you hear that word efficient, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a great thing, right? Think about in terms of when, in your daily lives, to be efficient, would that mean doing our homework for 20 minutes without distractions and getting it done? Or doing our homework and it takes us two hours and we have a bunch of distractions? Yeah, so the first option is going to be the most efficient, right? And we want to be efficient with our daily lives and we can be efficient with our technology and that's why LEDs being the most efficient light bulb are the best. So with this in mind, the number one thing we can be doing to be energy efficient is turning off devices when not in use. And I'm sure everyone at home who's watching this can do this too. And there are so many other things that we can be doing to become more energy efficient. And we will make sure to discuss that at the end. Because I hear that Sakai knows a thing or two about that. And Aaliyah actually too. Before we move on to that, let us use our device to play a really fun game of Trivia Crack. So now, for all of you at home, Please join in. We have many categories. We're going to be reviewing concepts that we talked about throughout our lesson here today. And I hope that you get all of them right. So Kai and Aaliyah here are going to be using their buzzers and I'm going to keep score of what they say. I want to make sure that I read the entire question before you buzz in. Are you guys ready? Let's go, Melly. Let's do it. So like I mentioned, we have many different categories. Our first one's energy transformations. When riding the energy bike, you were producing electrical energy from what other forms of energy? I remember talking about this in the beginning of the video. Chemical energy and mechanical. Chemical from the food we ate and mechanical spinning the bike wheels. Definitely. Here's your first point, Aaliyah. Great job. All right, we have energy efficiency. Which of the falling light bulbs is the most energy efficient? We just talked about this one a second ago. It's the nine watt LED. Very good. Nine watt LEDs are definitely the most energy efficient. It's why we got super excited when we were doing our cheer. All right, next category, electricity. What do we call the effect of using turbines, copper wire, and magnets to generate electricity? We talked about this one as well. It's the electromagnetic effect. Yes, very good, Sakai, the electromagnetic effect. Hey, you nice guys are job. doing really good. Are you at home doing really well, as, as, like Zakai and Aaliyah? All right, when using a toaster, you are converting electrical energy to? Thermal energy, because that's the heat to make a toast. That's right, thermal energy. There we go. We have a tied game, you guys. Natural resources. What energy source strikes solar panels to generate electricity? You mentioned this one, Melly. It's photons. Photons or sunlight. Very good, Aaliyah. All right, next category is electricity. And so what type of electricity do we demonstrate when using the UFO sticks? We demonstrated this one earlier with our friend Blair Snapchatting us. It's current electricity. Yes, very important that we distinguish current electricity from static electricity. Oh man, Sakai, you gotta catch up. You can get this one. Energy efficiency. Name the two energy sources that power a clothesline. I know this one. My clothes always dry faster when it's sunny outside and there's a breeze. So solar and wind. Very good. Well job, Sakai. You can tie this. You can make this a tying game. All right. History of science. Thomas Edison's incandescent light bulb was invented in? 
So I don't know this one off the top of my head, but I bet I could figure it out if I think about it. I know that there were definitely no light bulbs invented in the 1700s, but by 1918, that was already World War I, and there were a lot of light bulbs. So I'm gonna say 1879. Yes, very wow, good, nice Sakai. And yes, that's about 150 years ago. Tie game. Is everyone at home doing good too? All right, which of these is not a renewable resource? Unfortunately, natural gas is not a renewable resource. That's right, Aaliyah, but everything else on our screen is. All right, we're continuing. You guys are doing so well. Here's our double points. Which of the following is not associated with climate change? This one is volcanic eruptions because everything else up there actually does. Yes, thank you, Aaliyah. Volcanic eruptions naturally occur, whereas everything else, like Aaliyah said, is part of climate change. All right, next category is natural resources. What two energy sources are used the most to create electricity for Tucson? Definitely coal and natural gas at this point in time. Yes, and this is true for most cities in Arizona as well, is that coal and natural gas are primarily used for electricity production. All right. Another double, double point. points. Where could solar panels eventually be placed where they can operate 24-7, 365 days a year? So, in order for them to operate all the time, they need to be in a place where it's never nighttime, where the sun is shining constantly. So I'm gonna guess in space. Very, very good. Here's your double points bringing you to Pull seven. Ahead. And that reminds me, did you know that there's solar panels at the International Space Station? Wow, that's really cool, Molly. Yeah. Let's continue with natural resources. How long does it take the Earth to produce coal? This one I absolutely know. It's 250 million years. 250 million years indeed. Tied game. We only have a couple questions left. Natural resources. About how many pounds of coal are burned each year to provide the electricity for an average Tucson home? It's 9,000 pounds, which you said is about the equivalent to an elephant, which is a lot of coal. Very good, Aaliyah. This is bringing you to nine points. Man, you guys are doing so well. This is our final question, double points. Can methane gas from landfills be used to generate electricity? Yes, Melly, they absolutely can. All right, all right. This brings us to 11 points. It's a Kai at seven. Awesome. But everyone did a great job out there. You did awesome. I hope you at home. We're enjoying yourself, reviewing with us, and having fun with Trivia Craft. That was a lot of fun. Hey Sakai, you wanna tell us about how we can be more energy efficient? Absolutely, there are so many things that we can all do in our daily lives to save energy. Alia, let's hear the first one. So this one is probably the simplest. All you have to do is turn things off when you leave a room. Turn off the lights, turn off the ceiling fans, go ahead, it's super easy, just flip the switch. This goes for lights, also though, TVs, computers, video game systems, anything you get done using, make sure to turn it off. That way it's not still on and wasting energy. Another great way to save energy is by closing the blinds if it's really sunny and your room is getting hot from radiant energy. Also in the winter, if you're really cold, open up the blinds and let the sunlight warm you. A little tip about ceiling fans is that they don't actually change the temperature of the room that you're in. They just make you feel cooler by moving the air around. So if you're leaving the room and the fan is on, just go ahead and turn the fan off. Awesome. And this is another really important one, especially here in Arizona where it's super hot. Make sure that you leave your thermostat at a pretty reasonable range, not too hot and not too cold. And when you do want to change it, just adjust it by a little bit. Can you tell us why, Zakai? Yeah, if you adjust your thermostat by five or more degrees at a time, that system has to work extremely hard and waste a ton of energy to bring your whole home up to that temperature. But if you adjust it by only one or two degrees at a time, you'll still feel the same effects, but you won't waste as much energy. Awesome, and another really important and really simple way to save energy is by closing the refrigerator when you don't need it. So for example, if you're making a sandwich, take out all your ingredients and then close the fridge 
Make the sandwich, reopen the fridge, and put everything back. I know it might feel nice to stand with the cool air, but please just close the fridge and save a little bit of energy. This also applies to the front and the back doors of our houses. Try not to leave them open because then all the air conditioning just escapes out into the neighborhood. So if the AC is on, keep the doors and windows closed. Now, this is the most important thing for the whole presentation. Unfortunately, not everybody saw our video today, but you guys did. So please share what you learned with your friends and families. All of this stuff, especially the parts about energy efficiency are so, so important. So please share what you learned with your friends and families. Thank you, Sakai, and thank you, Aaliyah, and thank you for joining Unisource Energy with our presentation today. We hope that you continue learning and continue staying safe and well. We had a blast today. So until we see you in your classrooms next, continue to be healthy. Bye everyone. Bye guys. Bye.